Okay, many people in the Christian world obviously don't think that the sanctuary has anything to do with us today, and definitely that health has nothing to do with the Christian experience. But what are some of the things in the sanctuary that are related to health? Number one, the golden candlestick shows that Jesus was the light of the world. Do we need light for health? Physical light as well as spiritual light, right? The showbread, Jesus was the bread of life. What did Jesus say about physical as compared to spiritual food? The man shall not live by, but by, yes. Now, what was in the most holy place related to health? Okay. What was in the most holy place related to health? Where? In a pot inside the Ark of the Covenant, right? How is the health message related to the everlasting gospel? Is the health message a part of the everlasting gospel? Yes. Of course, because in the Old Testament, there was a health message. In the New Testament, there must be a health message. What was one of the responsibilities of the priests? Who'd like to read Luke chapter 5, verse 14? Luke chapter 5, verse 14. How about you read it for us, Matthew? Luke chapter 5, verse 14. Okay, so what did Jesus show here? What was the, the responsibility of the priest in that case? It was, it was the, sorry? Exactly, so that, that was a leper that was cleansed and the priest actually had to certify that he was truly cleansed and that he was leprosy free, right? Now, does the work of the priest have anything to do with us today? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And it says there, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who is that? Who is that? That's being described. It's, a, it's the Christian church, isn't it? So we're all called priests in the New Testament. So what was the dress of the priest symbolic of? Zechariah chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Lynn, maybe you can read that for us. Lynn? Zechariah chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, please. Did, did somebody want to loan her a Bible? Zechariah chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Would you read it, please? Yeah, yeah, let Lynn read it. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Then he asked when I spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he really said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe with, uh, you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head. Okay, good. So what is the dress of the priest symbolic of? And we're all supposed to be priests of God in the New Testament. So what is the, the dress of the priest symbolic of? Character or the righteousness of Christ. Now, how early did the light start to come about in health in our history? So what we're talking about here. That was the framework in the sanctuary. Now we want to start flushing it out. So how early did the light start to come about in concerning health in our history? When was the first health vision? Brother Timo, you know. When was the first health vision? No, no, no. The first health vision in our health message.
I think it was actually 1854, which he received the first one concerning uh, tobacco and alcohol. I think, I think it was 1854. Yeah, 1863 was a major one, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, you see, in the early days of Adventism, you could actually have pictures of Adventist preachers that were up on the rostrum with a, a pipe or a cigar in their hand because they were smoking. They didn't know. And we have to lift up the standard for the people, as it says in Isaiah. So the light is progressive. The path of the just is as a shining light, which shines more and more to the perfect day that we've also heard today. The light has always been progressive. Now, in 1858, Sister White said that pork eating was not a test of fellowship. She wrote that in Testimonies, Volume 1. She wrote that. But five years later, in 1863, pork eating was a test of fellowship. Because the light had come, she had received the major health vision, and she was shown that not only pork eating was bad, but all meat eaten was bad. In 1865, she was given instruction on dress, dress reform. And she was shown that for a person to be truly healthy, all of the limbs should be equally covered in the cold as well as the warm. Now, in 1866, only three years after the major health vision, what was established? What is this building here? Anybody have any idea? It was not the Battle Creek Sanitarium. That was many years yet. This was called the Western Health Reform Institute. It was a lot smaller and it wasn't a Battle Creek Sanitarium yet. Who do you think was ahead of the Health Institute, the Western Health Reform Institute? It wasn't John Harvey Kellogg. It was, he would have been only four years old at that point because he was born in 1862. Maybe it was Nellie Droulard, an educator and health in innovator who was born in 1844. I'm sure that there were many helpers and nurses in the early days of the Health Reform Institute. And we know the rest of the story about health reform in Adventism. It's not a good story because John Harvey Kellogg got lifted up in pride and the warnings started coming from the spirit of prophecy to avoid the impending judgment, avoid the, the sword of Damocles that was poised over it, and of course, it ended up burning to the ground. In 1888, a call was made to the delegates to live a life of temperance, but it lost by a thin vote. In 1902, she first started to say, God's people are going to put the eating of animal products away from them entirely. In 1909, she called for all of God's people to commit to a vegetarian diet. But the General Conference president at that time was not a vegetarian. Who was that? You should know. He was also the one that disfellowshipped the reformers. A.G. Daniels. He was not a vegetarian, and he said, no, 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 we don't want to have any kind of health pledge or anything like that in 1909. But in 1914, God's people, our spiritual forefathers, did commit to a pathway of vegetarianism, and they took their stand upon that. 
The knowledge of the necessity of exercise in the open air seems always to have been known because Sister White wrote about that. And all these things are important for happiness, aren't they? Health, relations, thankfulness. And some of these things are spiritual, some of them are physical, some of them are mental. Now what is the right balance between our own responsibility and giving our health into the hands of a professional? Because Aristotle said, happiness depends upon ourselves. Happiness is dependent upon ourselves, isn't it? Can we depend upon anybody else to make us happy? No way. We have to have happiness within ourselves because of our personal relationship with Christ, isn't it? But there are some times <coughs> when we might have to go for an operation like Sister Rosalie, right? She had to go for the operation, the hip replacement and be in all that time in the bed to recuperate. It wasn't dependent upon you. Jesus had a health message, didn't he? And we have to know the balance of when to ask a professional or trust in our own resources or God for healing, don't we? Now, did, did Jesus use natural remedies? Absolutely he did. Sure. In John chapter 9, the blind man came to him, and he could have just spoken the word. He could have said, be healed, but he didn't. Instead, he spat on the ground, made clay, and anointed the man's eyes and said, go wash in the pool in Siloam. And the man came seeing. So Jesus sanctioned natural remedies. Jesus was a great physician who never lost a case. What more can we find in the Bible about this? Well, in the Old Testament, we have many examples. Uh, Hezekiah, for example, uh, had a, a poultice of figs laid upon his boil uh, by uh, Isaiah and instructions about hygiene and uh, quarantine and so on, diet. And whatever time the God of the Bible has been merciful to his people in healing and helping them. I like the saying here, your mission should be the Christian's mission to be so busy loving your life, loving God, that you have no time for hate, regret, or fear. So has anyone tried to taunt you that there is no biblical reason to be a vegetarian? Yeah, I think every one of us have probably heard it at one time or another. So what can we show our fellow Christians that there is biblical reasons to be a vegetarian? Before, in the previous slide, there was Numbers chapter 11, when they asked God for meat to eat. He gave it to them the first time, but the second time, it angered him. And he told them, you're not going to eat meat only for a day or a week. You're going to eat it for a whole month until it comes out your nose. And many thousands of them died. And here in Isaiah 22, who can, who can read this here? Okay, Elaine. Thank you. Yes. Now Asa, in the 39th year of his reign, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Isn't that what a lot of Christians do today? Sometimes even we may do? He sought not to God, but to the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign, approximately two years later. So what did God's servant tell us about drug medication? Should we be taking drugs? 
No. We should be educating away from drugs. Use them less and less and depend upon more upon hygienic agencies then nature will respond to God's positions. Pure air, pure water, proper exercise, a clear conscience, and so on. Many times the side effects of the drugs are worse than the malady itself. So, what is the message that we have to bear to the people today? Just in the red? Helen, read the red, please. In the advocacy of the cause of temperance, our efforts are to be multiplied. The subject of Christian temperance should find a place in our sermons in every city where we labor. So Christian temperance, regardless of where we labor, should be a part of the message. How was Sister White involved in this preaching of temperance in her time? Was she involved? Very much so. She was really a sought-after temperance speaker. Wherever she went, they wanted her to speak, and she often did speak on temperance. Does temperance have anything to do with the Elijah message? We're supposed to be giving the Elijah message today, right? Does temperance have anything to do with that? Absolutely. Because Elijah was a, a health reformer and a dress reformer. Perhaps you've heard of a book called Prophetess of Health. Have you heard of that book? Anybody heard of the book Prophetess of Health? No? Well, some allegations are made by the author of the book, Prophetess of Health, that Ellen G. White simply copied other famous health authors of her time. But it really doesn't make any sense because many of the things went straight across her own ideas. And John Harvey Kellogg, who's pictured here, uh, said that the reason why he was a, a head of so many of his contemporaries is because he paid heed to the writings of Ellen G. White. It takes faith, hope, and love to reach and heal men's hearts. Now, what about all the controversies over acupuncture and pressure, iridology, phrenology, vegetarianism, magnetic and homeopathic healers? Even in our own church, there are these controversies. So what do we believe? Are these things okay? Are they good? Are they bad? Is vegetarianism okay? I guess we, th we believe in that. The apostles of nearly all forms of spiritism claim to have power to heal. They attribute this power to electricity, magnetism, the so-called sympathetic remedies, or to latent forces within the mind of man. They also claim to be clairvoyants or magnetic healers. And many people, even amongst Christians, go to these spiritualistic healers and think that they're going to be healed. And some of them even are healed. And Ahaziah had God's wrath kindled against him because he didn't trust God, but rather he sought for this kind of healing to the God of Ekron. Some guiding principles. Those who give themselves up to the sorcery of Satan may boast of great benefit received, but does this prove their course to be wise or safe? What if life should be prolonged? Okay, so satanic agencies can prolong life. What if temporal gain should be secured? They can do that too. Will it pay in the end to have disregarded the will of God? No, not at all. And she also talked about latent in the mind of man, clairvoyant, what do clairvoyants do? They communicate with the dead, don't they? And they do hypnotic kind of remedies. Is hypnotism okay? Anybody done hypnotism therapy? You know, quit smoking, anything? What's wrong with hypnotism? It's one man's mind over another man's mind. And even the best of men will become corrupted when there's that kind of influence. That to depend upon something from within the mind and heart of man would be to give ourselves up to another's control and ultimately to Satan. And of course, they profess to communicate with the dead as well. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. 
mental and emotional health are related to spiritual health, aren't they? In the major health vision she had, there were things going directly against her own ideas as well. She said, I was astonished at the things shown me in vision. Many things came directly against my own ideas. So the, the light that she received were against her own ideas. Other reasons that the prophetess of health doesn't make any sense with his allegations is that she was writing really against many of the things that the health experts of her day were for. Like uh, true dress reform, she went away from unbalanced and extreme things in diet, and she opposed many of their ideas on water treatments and so on. We always have a choice, either follow a crowd or follow the Lord. And finally, God's people will have to stand out from all of the fallen world so that we may give the loud cry. One of the signs of the everlasting gospel is the Sabbath, just like one uh, is the message of health that God has given to us. Just in the red, who'd like to read that for us? Just the red. John Formosa, can you see that? Go ahead, Matthew. Yes, and again in the red. So you will never be ministers after the gospel order unless you do what? Show a decided interest in medical missionary work, the gospel of healing and blessing and strengthening. Uh, down here, they should study from cause to effect, read the best authors on these subjects about health, and obey religiously that which your reason tells you is truth. In other words, she recognized that health reform, like all the light, was progressive. An attitude of gratitude is very important. Have you ever met someone in the church who's always complaining of the things that they cannot eat or drink? So the real question is, are we thankful for this gift? Or do we resent it? Is there going to be any meat eater in heaven? Is there going to be any dairy or sugar in heaven? How are the righteous going to dress then? Medical missionary work is the work of the gospel. Take hold of the medical missionary work and it will give you access to the people. Their hearts will be touched as you minister to their necessities. So in conclusion, Step by step, he has led us to give up self-indulgent practices of the world and the, substitute the helpful things of nature. Does God want us to be healthy? Yes, he does. How has he led his people to be healthy? He's given us light, and he asks us to follow it. There's a link between our minds, our bodies, and our spirits. Like Solomon said, a merry heart does good like a medicine. We are to show that we care for people regardless of what they believe or perhaps what they brought upon themselves. So, I have a test here, but I'm not going to put you through all the questions. Uh, what would you say to someone who said, show me where in the Bible it says we cannot eat meat? Where could you show them? Sorry? Genesis, sure, that was the original diet. But also in Numbers, in Isaiah. Sorry? First Corinthians? Okay, because they lusted in the wilderness for evil things, which was also meat. What is the importance of the concept found, especially in the New Testament, of our bodies or the temple of the Holy Spirit? Just with that one thing, that would be enough to say, no, we shouldn't eat meat today, right? How is the progression of light important in the message of health? Is it important? Very much so. Oh yeah, I, I didn't want to miss this. We should start, just like they have in London, start with the resources that you have on hand in prayer, and the Lord will bless you with more people for whom you can minister, and they will bring you more resources and help you to help others. They're, they're massaging people and giving them aromatherapy in London, and they're really helping and healing and blessing people. You and I can do the same thing. 
There's people all around us that are hurting, that are sick, that don't know which way to turn. And if we try to help and heal them, the Lord will bless us as we try to bless them. How is the progression of light important in developing the SDA message in other aspects, like the sanctuary? How long did it take them to fully understand the sanctuary? Do we fully understand the sanctuary today? Well, I'm not sure, but it probably took them a 20 to 30 years to really start to get it straight what was going on in the sanctuary. What is a clairvoyant and magnetic healer? Somebody who believes in mind over mind or communicating with the dead? What is to be our guide in investigating new methods of healing? To study the latest and the best authors and to follow religiously what the Spirit of God shows us to be true. Finish the sentence. The health message is to be as an entering wedge. Exactly. How is the health message to triumph in conjunction with what key message? That's it. And is the health message to be allowed to eclipse the three angels' messages? Absolutely not. They, they're to work hand in hand. What are some of the things in the Bible that show us we should have a health message to give to the people today? What are some of the things in the Bible, in the sanctuary, that tell us that we have a health message today? What's in the sanctuary? Remember? The pot of manna. The bread. That's right, Edward. And? How do they get the light? Oil? Oil? Yeah, but the, the candlestick. And we need light for health, don't we? Not only physical light, but spiritual light. And personal question. What can I do to further this message and help my family, friends, and neighbors with their health? If we pray that the Lord will answer that question for us and that we can step out by faith, I think he will bless us.